So, first of all, I'm not a computer language designer. I want to make it very clear that I've never had that intention. Okay, that's not, what I'm mostly interested in is the use of languages. I'm, I use them, I'm a user. Okay, so that's quite different from almost everybody who's talked so far. Um, and in particular, I have a very a particular use, which a guy alluded to, which is the rep representation of knowledge. It's from the AI view of the world. How is it that I can express the things I want to express about the things I know so that not only can a computer understand it, but so can a, you. It's important to me that I can give you a program to read and you can learn something from it that I've, that I've, I've figured out. And if you give me a program to read, then I can read it and I'll learn something from what you figured out. Okay, so that's a, a very important goal, which is rather probably different from mo most of the computer language design in the world. Okay, now, in particular, well, we go back, you know, I was, we got into something like this. You all know about this, this weird book, okay? Uh, this weird book was a, an attempt to tell this to freshmen, and it worked pretty well, okay? And of course, just saying it for the first, for the first 10 seconds, uh, you know that there is a particular kind of knowledge that we all uh, deal with, which is the, the, uh, mathematical knowledge that's pretty standard. And uh, there is also another kind of knowledge which until recently has not been effectively form formalized, which is this kind of knowledge. And many of you have seen this kind of, of slide that I put up all the time. And this is, you, you, so this is not something new or different. Uh, the, of course, the, the one thing that has changed is we now have computer languages whereby we can be very precise about the things that we say, so that in fact for complicated problems, not simple ones like this, I can tell you something that could not have been said before in any reasonable, precise way, okay? So, however, something you probably, most of you probably don't know is that I'm very interested in, in physics, okay? And so you're gonna see some physics today, okay? Okay, now we, in particular, I started out uh, a few years ago being interested in celestial mechanics and uh, with my, friend, uh, my friends at Caltech, uh, I built a special purpose machine for doing orbital mechanics calculations. This is sitting on the grass at Caltech uh, in 1983. Uh, this particular machine did some useful things. Uh, among other things, it demonstrated that the solar system was chaotic. This is uh, a little, uh, little uh, article by the, the editor of Science. Uh, we, get, we, we got some... Uh, we got some pretty good, pretty good stuff going there. Okay, this seems to be a very important paper that uh, made that machine end up in the Smithsonian in Washington. Not that I want to tell you about that either. And there's another one also in Science Magazine of that sort. End of story. Okay, end of story. Okay, but just to give you the feeling, what I'm interested in. Okay, I'm interested in the use of. See, I learned a lot. Okay, I want to be able to tell you the things I've learned. And that's, what, uh, and that's the, the sort of idea that I want to get into. Now, of course, I would have liked to have written this book. So. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is, of course, one of my great heroes. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's written in Latin, and I can't even read it. Okay, it's uh, very sad. Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. So with a friend of mine, we wrote a book called Structure and Interpretation of Classical Mechanics, which many of you may have seen. Uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a, a scheme programmer's uh, view of, the fi of, of physics at the sort of advanced level, starting with <coughs> Lagrange's equations and going through canonical perturbation theory. Okay, and I will, I will tell you a bit about this. Uh, what I'll tell you about is not this book in preci precisely, but the motivations for it and some examples that illustrate why programming is an essential idea. <coughs> okay, that's the thing I wish to show you today. Okay? Well, the motivation for writing this book was a, a thing, I, I, when trying to learn all this stuff, way back when I was an undergraduate, I uh, used to read things like Arnold's Mathematical Methods of Classical Mechanics. You know, you've seen that book. He, he, he's a son of a bitch, okay? He's written things like this, and this, this is a, in a footnote, okay, in his book. Okay, there's... <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's talking about... He's talking about the principle of least action, and he says, I'm not going to help you understand it. <laughs> now, so this gets me real mad, because okay? uh, I really like students. The, by, by contrast, my, uh, one of my other heroes, Mr. Einstein, uh, tries very hard to be very clear. Okay? And of course, he wrote a, uh, a nice thing on, on the introduction to a book that was published after he was dead, uh, which explains that he was actually interested in you know, reading and understanding what he was writing about. Okay? Very, a very different approach, and I'm interested in that too. <clears throat> so what are the impediments to learning about physics? 
Well, let's just start with mathematical notation. Mathematical notation fundamentally sucks. Okay, and I'll, 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 I'll show that to you in an instant. Okay? So a few things to see. First of all, uh, <coughs> you know what this is, right? Cosine square x, right? Everybody knows this is cosine x times cosine x, right? Okay? Very sensible. Okay, however, cosine <coughs> minus 1 of x, okay? This is not 1 over cosine x. Can you understand how horrible this is to a little kid in the middle of the <laughs> high school okay, who's logical and smart? The dumb ones will understand this, but the smart ones won't. Okay? It's a, it's a, this is only a microscopic example, but I just want to make it very clear that mathematicians have not been very careful about notation. And there's a reason for that. It's not like they're dumb. The reason is that it's natural language to them. English is not a consistent language either. And the way you de deal with it, when I'm telling you something, if something that is a, a new thing that you might want to know about, well, we've assumed that there's a humongous amount of, uh, of commonality between what I already know and what you already know, such that only a little increment, I have to paint a picture in your mind of what's in my mind. And it can be impressionistic. And so mathematical notation is, in fact, an impressionistic natural language, which thereby is no good for teaching elementary stuff. Okay, so in fact, I'm going to show you some great ways to get the right answer by wrong arguments, and that doesn't go if you really want to understand what's going on. So I'm going to start with something that, unfortunately, well, I'll leave it up here, uh, but I'm, this is, <laughs> maybe I'll write it on the blackboard also to, slowly, to make it slowly enough so that we understand it. Okay. The laws of nature are often represented in terms of something called Lagrangians. A Lagrangian is a, a scalar description of the, uh, of the ways particles move. Okay? And in particular, what it is, is it's a, in the case of, of point particles that are involved only in, in, uh, uh, in fields that are based on position, as in, for example, the motion of planets or the motions of, of other things, uh, they, uh, they're written down as the difference of a kinetic energy and potential energy. That's called Hamilton's principle. Hamilton was the guy who invented quaternions and a lot of other smart things. Okay? And so what there is here is a, is a thing which is the difference between the kinetic energy, one half uh, m uh, x dot squared, where x dot is the velocity, okay, minus a potential energy, v of x. This is a Hamiltonian for a single particle in a, in a, in a field which is uh, defined in terms of a like, potential energy of uh, gold v, okay, which depends only on position. And of course, this could be many dimensions, so I'm not going to worry about that. Now, it turns out once you've done this, you can immediately get Newton's equations in a, in a coordinate independent way, and that's why people do it. And this is the process by which you do it. There is a particular derivation that was invented by Euler, and I'm not going to give the derivation, which is dv dt dl by dq dot minus dl by dq equals zero. And this is called the Lagrange equations, which will, I will now demonstrate will get us Newton's equations by the method you see up here. Okay? So there's a couple of things you do. You say, okay, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a partial derivative. Uh, what's dl by dq dot? Well, q, what's the q? q is x dot here, x is q, which e. I'm just an alpha renaming, but we'll worry about that later. Uh, this is, uh, so this is, uh, what is it, m x dot. And I also want to take a derivative with respect to the, the position. It not only appears in this term in this case, although it's possible in a real system that the mass might depend upon time. Okay? It might depend upon position. And in fact, it does if you have something like a double pendulum, the mass charm term depends upon position. But I'm not going to worry about that right now. Uh, dl by dq is, uh, what is it? Minus uh, d minus, what is it? Oh, yeah, dv by dx. Okay. It's hard to do uh, algebra on the blackboard. So this is the gra minus the gradient of the potential energy at the force. Okay? Now, this is the momentum. And I want to take the derivative of the momentum. So of course, I do a dot manipulation. Now, hold on a second. I'm about to do something very weird. Give it a The L by dq dot is going to be uh, mx double dot, which is the mass times the acceleration. Oh boy, that, that's the right answer. The mass times acceleration is, minus the, is the force, which is minus the degree of the potential energy. But I've done something really weird. In writing these down, I've assumed that I could vary independently the position and the velocity. Okay? Uh, but over here, I, I know that 
And what I'm really deciding is dip and dt of x dot, I'm oh, sorry, x equals x dot. Whoops. So they're not independent. So the whole basis of the thing I just did, which works to get the right answer every time, is wrong. That's not what's going on. Okay? So of course, this is the kind of thing that's really difficult to learn. You know, I figured out that when I was an undergraduate, I got all the answers right, but I had no idea what was happening. Okay? And it was very interesting. I get A's in all these classes and made no sense at all. Okay? So this is, of course, that's a very common thing that students discover in, uh, in places like MIT. Uh, <laughs> And you're using the problem here is a notational one, and I'll be very careful about this. Uh, using the traditional notation, a student often learns to get the correct answer without understanding what's really happening. At this stage, the goal should be understanding ideas, not manipulating symbols on a page. Okay, and that's very, very important and very sad. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, you never can figure out anything without, without programming. That's certainly true. But here's another piece of Arnold stuff. Arnold, such a son of a bitch. Okay, he's, he says, it is necessary to use the apparatus of partial derivatives, in which even the notation is ambiguous, so he admits it. Okay? And then he gives an example of what's ambiguous about it. So what the hell is he using in this crappy notation? The notation was invented 300 years ago, and it was by, by Leibniz. Newton had this other bad one with dots. Neither one's any good. There was a guy who didn't understand this idea. A fellow by the Spivak wrote a great book called Calculus on Manifolds. Let me get rid of these blackboard for the moment. Whammo. Okay? Where he explains actually what's wrong with the notation in a serious way. And if anybody wants to, I don't want to go through this right now, but f on this side and f on this side of the chain rule are two different things. The symbols are not even uh, sensible. So we invent a, a notation, uh, I suppose, this one, okay, for a partial derivative or a capital D for a total derivative, which in fact is talking about the way we do it as computer programmers. We're talking about bound variables, free variables, everything makes sense. Okay, and we're talking about derivative with respect to a position in a function call, not a, not a, uh, not a name. And so, in fact, uh, I'm going to say use a, 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 a notation based on Mr. Spivak. So let's figure out what this actual Lagrange equations mean. Okay, so you see the Lagrange equations here. And here's a, here, what is it going on? What's going on is this. And I apologize for those of you who hate physics, but I'm not surprised. You see, I mean, the, the way we teach it is such that no doubt you should be hating it. Um, look at this. Okay? So what's really going on is what's what Roger's equation is trying to do. It's trying to test a path to determine whether or not that path is a, is a realizable path considering the physical situation. Is it, in fact, a... Uh, a, a solution of the equations, or uh, to be real, really careful, is it a thing which minimizes the action, which is the, the way this is being formulated? Okay, so, but the path never appears in Lagrange's equations written in this traditional way. So that's already wrong. It's missing the, 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 the odd thing we're interested in. What's really going on is that this is some impressionistic version of this, of what you see right here. Okay? What we're saying is there's a path W, happens to, we're going to give names to, we're going to take variable, we have a function L, which has three basic kinds of arguments, a time, a position, and a velocity. Okay? We're taking partial derivatives of L, which produces, by the way, a function of three, of three arguments, three result, with three, three formal parameters. Okay? Still a position, a time, and a velocity. Okay, and however, we're going, to, we're going to substitute in for the position. After we've taken this partial derivative, we substitute in the position, the path, and the derivative of the path, that's the time derivative for q and q dot, producing a function only of time, which then is perfectly possible to take a time derivative of. Okay, and we're comparing that with the forces at that, at that moment. And that that should be zero. That's actually what's not said. And you, I, I dare you to find a book that does it, that shows you this. Because it's ugly, you see? It's very ugly. It's not very nice for computers. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, is it possible that what you see at the top is a, not just impressionistic, but more specifically a combinatorical version? No, of it's not mind? right. It's a typo. It's totally wrong. Yes. Okay. And in fact, there are much worse ones, much more egregious ones I can't talk about here because I have to talk for an hour, you know, describe it to you. People make horrible mistakes. If you look in Goldstein's book on, on mechanics, which is the one most people have learned from, the derivations of Hamilton's equations are just wrong. 
However, he, he, he understands that they're wrong, and then he makes it, it gets all uh, up and elaborate about it and starts trying to explain to you why it's okay. Uh, <laughs> that, with lots of words, yeah. Okay? It's pretty interesting. Okay. Anyway, uh, here's what's going. Let's, go, let's make this simpler, first of all. We're going to make this into a functional language. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that I really want partial derivatives. Okay, and part, this is the partial derivative with z count on the zero based indexing man, zero, one, two. This is the partial derivative with respect to the second position of this function, gives me a new function, which is then applied to these things. Okay? So this is it. This is already one thing that's done. Now instead, let's take this, this object. This object is a function of a path which produces a function of time. Right? And it's still down in some ordinary notation of a mathematical kind, and that's what that's what it, what it looks like. Okay? Well, uh, however, that means that I can I can read now write this thing this way. Okay? Now, of course, if I also realize that I just want to write the, that the derivative of a function is a new function, and I'm not dealing with expressions because expressions are no good anyway. One over one over what? One over one over r one plus one over r two equals r one r two over r one plus r two. They have the same function, but they're different expressions. The function's what matters. Okay, and so uh, what here's what we've got. This is a nice representation, and it makes sense. It's got an explicit place to put a path. It's got a thing that extends that path to the state, to a path in the state space, and I can take derivatives of it. This is a, a, a derivative of a function of one argument. This is a partial derivative of a function of three arguments, which produces a three arguments, a function of three arguments, which is composed with something that produce out th puts out three values. Okay, so there's no type error anymore. That's the combinatorial version. No, but I'm saying that the original thing is is yeah, is not translatable yeah, in a nice yes, way. There's the no. Bottom, but the bottom line is the bottom oh line. yes, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry. I thought he was asking whether or not one could interpret what these people are doing as something which, by a mechanical process, no. produces. No, that's not true because no, all the dot no. manipulation in the world is there's about 42 ways of dot. I can show you a completely inconsistent dot notation that happens in the next chapter of something. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so the crucial thing here is functional programming allows us to, to be precise, okay? That we, we, it can be precise enough so we can teach to a dumb computer. If we can teach to a dumb computer and I'll give you the computer program, then you can understand what's going on. Okay? That's very important. The other, the other way to say it is that, is that the computer is not going to let you become imprecise because it just isn't going to work. Right? So you want things to work, and then so the other way, a way to think about it that way. <clears throat> And so the schemification of this is trivial. Okay? Now we've got a language that's a one-to-one -one correspondence with scheme. Okay? And there it is. Okay? For those of you who like the sort of thing, this is the sort of thing you like. Everybody in this audience <laughs> understands this. If I go to a physics department, they're going to freak out at this point. They see a lot of parentheses. Wait, Jerry, how do physicists react to this? The right way. The, the young ones are very excited. The very old ones are very excited. And the ones around age 40 are not going to have anything to do with me at all. <laughs> and the reason is very simple. The young ones are, are, are not yet committed to anything. The old ones are no longer are chasing after, uh, after a Nobel Prize. And the, and the middle-aged ones are so busy working on, with their nose to the grindstone on their next experiment or their next, their next thing that they don't have time to think about something new. And they're right. For their th careers, it's the wrong thing to think about. Okay? But anyway, this is, this is what happens here. Of course, you write programs like that, and of course, such a program is useful independent of anything else. How much time do I have, by the way? Five minutes, good. Okay, I'll, I'll go very fast. Boom. I can compute <laughs> Lagrangians and, and things. And, uh, and, you know, get answers. <laughs> you know, I'm fine. I'm, I'm not interested in this stuff to show you right now, but I'm going to show you something else that's more fun. Okay, boom. Ah. So much for that. See, this is the problem is I can talk about, the, there's, there's a lot of stuff to talk about here. Where does this idea come from? That's very important. How, does it, how did I get myself into this? This came from the fact that I was teaching electrical engineering students in the, in the 70s, okay? before I even I met Guy Steele, amazingly enough. Okay? And so I was in 1974, I was teaching introductory electrical circuits. Okay? I'm going to show you something just for fun. Okay? Cause it's a, the idea was, how do I get it across to them, how I behave as a, as a, as a professional engineer. See, electrical circuits are an abstraction of the physical world. Okay, and when we normally teach electrical circuit stuff. Oh, by the way, this is Thermofax from 1974. Look at the colors. Okay, remember that stuff? Okay. Anyway, so we teach things with equations and so on. Nobody can understand it, right? Standard stuff. That's the standard bug. 
Now, however, when you walk into a classroom and you give a student something like that, they freak out okay, for the first time, and for good reason. It's very complicated. It's got a bunch of nonlinear equations. There's no way to solve this. Okay, but this is an amplifier, and I can tell you how it works. And so you watch me what I do. Okay, because I'm going to solve this. I do this all the time for people, and they're always freaked. They say, see, they're amazed how quickly and easy it is to understand this. For those of you who don't know anything about electrical circuits, it's tough. <laughs> watch what I do, not what I say. Okay? So this is a, this is, this is a, uh, uh, an amplifier. Uh, what I have here is a voltage divider. I'm going to look at this in the DC bi uh, bias conditions. That means I'm, I'm assuming my capacitors are open circuited. And so I've got a voltage divider here. Uh, that means I know the voltage here because I know the voltage here and I know the voltage here. Since I know the voltage here, this voltage is 0.6 volts below it. This voltage is 0.6 volts below that. Therefore, I know the current through this resistor. So I know the current that must be coming up through, the, through this transistor through that resistor because I'm assuming that there's no, uh, no current going to the base of a transistor. Okay? That's an assumption. It could be wrong. Okay? It will be, in fact, slightly wrong. Now, that means I know the currents are going through here, but since I know the voltage over here, I know the voltage over here, therefore I know the voltage over here, therefore I know the voltage here is 0.6 volts below that. This is a pair of uh, resistors in series, therefore I know the current through those resistors because I know the voltage here and the voltage here, therefore I know the current through here, therefore I know the voltage over there, and therefore I know the, the current at this, therefore I know the voltage at this point, and therefore I know the voltage here, and therefore I know the current through this, and I know all the DC bias conditions, and I can figure out the gain for you in no time at all also. It turns out my very simple <laughs> argument, if I Wiggle this a little bit, then I wiggle this by the same amount, which I wiggle that by the same amount, which means I wiggle this by an amount, which is the ratio of that resistor to this resistor because the currents through these two resistors are the same, which means, so, that's, that's, so this goes down when this goes up by R3 over R4, and by a similar argument, this one goes up when this one goes down by R5 over R6, so therefore the, the gain of this uh, amplifier in the mid-range is R5 over R6 times R3 over R4. Okay? Now, the point is, the point is, that that's something that every engineer knows how to do, and no freshman knows how to do it. How can I ever express it? And the only way I can think of expressing it is writing a program that does what I do. Okay? Now, Stalin and I worked on this for some time, and we wrote a program that does what I do. Okay? I learned this trick by watching another great engineer by the name of Paul Penfield. Okay? That's how I learned how to do this. That although I've been good at things, I never was very good at that. That good at, and it turned out it was very simple. Okay, it turned out it was very simple. It was a, a little local things. You you have little little rules that allow you to see only locally what happens and make annotations to the diagram. And the diagram is your memory. <coughs> okay, and it's only a finite number of places to put things on the diagram, so you don't get wa you don't waste your time. Okay? And that program turns out to be very simple. I'm not going to show it to you today. Don't have the time. But a program to do this is five pages of modern language. Which means if I give it to a student that can understand it, they've already got a program. And so that's pretty much what I want to show you about. So here's the, here's the conclusions. I've got a few conclusions. Programming forces one to be precise and formal without being rigorous. What I mean by rigorous and formal are quite different. Formal means you know what the damn uh, power series we're talking about. Rigorous means you know it converges. Okay? <laughs> the computer does not tolerate Vague or descriptions or incomplete instructions, therefore one becomes aware of one's unsupported conclusions. That's one thing. By the way, just to point out, this is relevant to everything. Even, even poets understand that, the, that, that engineering is used to make a good poem. And this is a very important paper, which I think everybody should look up, by Edgar Allan Poe, where he explains how he made the raven so as to produce the appropriate effect in the reader by putting together pieces that have the appropriate effect in the right way. And he, he debugged it. He had to smooth out places which didn't work. He had to understand the consequences of his, of his actions. Every poet know, does this. Most of them don't know what they do. Okay? Or probably the most important quote of all here is from the only part of this that matters is the title to this paper that Mitski wrote in 61, I think which is why programming is good medium for expressing poorly understood and sloppily formulated ideas. Exactly the opposite of people who would want to <coughs> plague me with type theory. <laughs> <laughs> for example, okay? And the, the, the person who is probably most responsible for realizing this is a very important idea in education is Seymour Capital. So I'm, I'm, he's interested in the little children. I'm interested in the ones that are much older than me. Okay? So much for that. 
That's it for it. It's a well-known feature, okay? Because you know, getting the result is all that matters. Yes. Oh well, I don't know about much about mathematics since I've never used it. Uh, I write my own, uh, but I don't much like Mr. Wolfram. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.